Hello and welcome. I'm Jeff Peachman, a PhD student at the University of Washington studying plasma physics. And today I've got some interesting news for you. So here's your four main fusion news stories for this week. One, Marvel Fusion lands $70 million for a laser powered fusion vet. Two, fusion fuel mix could stabilize burning plasma. Three, researchers build AI model database to find new alloys for nuclear fusion facilities. Four, after latest ITER delay, senators quiz fusion experts over commercial reactor timelines. And at the end, there's some short bonus stories as well. So let's get started. One, Marvel Fusion lands $70 million for a laser-powered fusion bet. This first story is from TechCrunch. Marvel Fusion is a member of the Fusion Industry Association. Marvel was founded back in 2019, and they had a Series A venture capital raise back in 20, 2022 of just under 40 million US dollars. Now, they've just completed their Series B round, raising just under $70 million. So Marvel has an interesting approach to fusion, fusion energy, which really stood out to me. They're developing an inertial confinement fusion system, which uses lasers to compress a pellet of fusion fuel. If you follow the fusion scene, you know this is nothing new. The same method is used at NIF, the National Ignition Facility. And NIF was the first facility to reach scientific breakeven back in 2022, and no one else has done it. But Marvel's approach has some important differences. So first, let's look at how NIF works. A single laser source is split into 192 separate beams, which are then amplified and they all converge on a very expensive target. Each target is essentially a work of art. The very center of each one is a deuterium and tritium vapor, which is then contained in a shell of deuterium tritium ice, and that must be cooled below 20 Kelvin. The ice is surrounded by a thin shell of synthetic diamond called the ablator. The diamond layer marks the outside of the fuel pellet, which is the diameter of a peppercorn. And that peppercorn sits in a small X-ray oven called the whole room. The whole room is a cylinder about the size of the eraser on a pencil, and it's made of gold. And the lasers enter holes on the whole room and strike it on the inside, exciting the gold and releasing X-rays, which then converge on the fuel pellet and compresses that diffusion conditions. So energy is released and it destroys this very expensive, very cool target. So NIF is a very impressive technical feat, but as you can imagine, it's too expensive for a commercial power plant to be making all these expensive targets. Marvel is one of the companies hoping to change that. So first, their target is designed to be much cheaper. It's composed of alternating layers of silicon and fusion fuel. The advantage of using silicon is that they can leverage the semiconductor manufacturing technologies to mass manufacture the targets. They claim that they can make 5,000 targets on a single standard 300 millimeter silicon wafer. The silicon is structured as tiny rods, and that's designed to couple the laser energy into the fuel. And the fuel itself is a compound of hydrogen and boron-11, which is solid at room temperature. So their laser systems will also be much more efficient than those at NIF, which should help them reach breakeven. Now, as an aspiring plasma physicist, I need to point out that it's much harder to fuse hydrogen and boron than to fuse deuterium and tritium. And some physicists will claim that it's impossible to reach breakeven with that fuel. So in my opinion, Marvel has made a trade between cost and physics risk, but they acknowledge that fact and they're open to other fuel combinations. They are starting with the cheapest option first, solving whatever problems that they can, and they will add cost later as needed. And from my experience in industry, that's not a bad way to approach a difficult problem. This sort of innovation is important to explore the solution space so that we can lower the costs of fusion energy. Two, fusion fuel mix could stabilize burning plasma. This story comes from eurofusion.org. Most fusion companies plan to use the fusion fuels deuterium and tritium. And they're doing that because they're the easiest to fuse. But you can't find natural deposits of tritium because it has a 12 year half-life. When we have fusion power plants, we will need to produce what we need from breeder blankets. But until that time, there's just not enough tritium to go around. So most experiments currently run with just deuterium. And that's very cheap and plentiful. As plasma physicists, we measure a deuterium plasma and then we 
can predict what kind of neutron yield we would expect if we were actually using tritium in that plasma. It may not be that simple. Uh, so for example, tritium is heavier than deuterium. So on average, tritium ions will move more slowly than deuterium ions at the same temperature. And there's other differences as well. So it's important to actually measure how the plasma compositions affects subtle things in the plasma, such as turbulence or instabilities. Last year, experiments were performed on JET, which was the only tokamak in the world capable of using tritium fuel. Researchers were surprised that their performance was better than they expected, both in the core of the plasma and at the edges. They found that fast ions, such as alpha particles, were able to stabilize the turbulence in the plasma when tritium was present. And so in layman's terms, tritium has a calming effect on the plasma, which is very good news for everyone trying to use tritium. It makes a fusion power plant just a little bit easier. Three, researchers build AI model to find new alloys for nuclear fusion facilities. Fizz.org brought us this story about new materials for fusion. So let's talk about the first wall of a fusion power plant like a tokamak or a stellarator. The first wall faces the plasma and it needs to survive high temperatures. In the past, the wall was made of graphite because graphite can take the heat and it's cheap. But graphite tends to absorb tritium, which is a really bad thing because we need that stuff. So they started making the walls out of tungsten because tungsten has the highest melting point of all metals. That caused a lot of new problems because tungsten has a lot of electrons. So when tungsten gets knocked off the wall and gets into the plasma, it becomes ionized and it releases all those electrons into the plasma and electrons radiate away energy. So the more electrons you have in the plasma, the more energy you're radiating away. Another problem with tungsten is that it's very brittle and hard to work with, and it gets worse over time as it gets bombarded with neutrons. So it's not the ideal solution. Materials scientists at Oak Ridge National Lab want to discover better first wall materials. And their approach is really interesting to me. Uh, they know they want a material which is some combination of refractory metals. These include niobium, tantalum, vanadium, molybdenum, hafnium, and zirconium. These are all high temperature metals with fewer electrons than tungsten, which is good, but it would cost too much and take too long to create and test every possible combination of those elements. So they want to train an AI to suggest the best possible alloys in terms of composition and crystalline structure. But an AI needs training data, and that's what this story is about. To get the training data, they ran these complex quantum mechanical calculations on supercomputers at the Department of Energy. Their first database covers only three of the six elements that I listed, niobium, tantalum, and vanadium. They simulated various combinations of these elements with different crystalline structures. And simulating this is a cost savings over actually making it, but it's still cost prohibitive to run these simulations on these very expensive supercomputers. So a subset of the alloys was simulated to generate a database, and that is used to train a deep learning model. The model itself will then be used to suggest the candidate materials to be simulated and eventually even fabricated. So this is a really cutting edge way to perform material science research, and it sounds very familiar to me. So for example, the pharmaceutical industry is leveraging computational chemistry and AI for drug discovery. So why not new materials discovery? While this new approach is motivated by the challenges of fusion energy, we can imagine many industries that would benefit from new materials developed with similar tools. And on to our last story, number four. After a latest ITER delay, senators quiz fusion experts over commercial reactor timelines. On September 19th, the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources held a hearing concerning the timeline for commercial fusion energy. Senator Manchin and Senator Barrasso began discussing the competition with China over fusion technology. It's Dr. J.P. Elaine, the Associate Director of Fusion Energy Sciences at the Department of Energy, he was asked, what does America need to do to protect its competitive advantage in the fusion space? Dr. Elaine's response was, quote, to realize fusion in a decadal time frame, we will need to take bold action to address the critical scientific and technological gaps that remain 
and establish the supply chains that will enable fusion energy at scale. So he introduced the DOE's new strategy, which is to leverage public-private partnerships in fusion, including guidance on how fusion companies can measure their success as they make progress. With these partnerships, he hopes that we can build a robust fusion technology and manufacturing base for specialized materials and components that fusion companies need. He also argued that the role of government should be to focus on the technology gaps that are common to many of the fusion approaches. So for example, many companies plan to use tritium. So government should support development of breeding blanket technology and the entire tritium fuel cycle, which benefits all of those companies. So we heard many opinions about how the US can accelerate fusion to win a fusion technology race against China. But this more adversarial approach was not embraced by everyone. Senator Angus King asked, quote, why does this have to be a competition with China? This isn't a military technology. This is a civilian technology that's going to affect all of the rest of us. Why can't this be a breakthrough in the relationship between our two countries where we work together? Now, Ms. Siebens replied that we need to secure a supply chain which dominates the fusion industry because if we can't, China will. And if I can be so bold as to share my opinion, I'm not sure I entirely agree. I think that we need to be competitive and we should try to be the best. But I think the world is big enough for multiple major players. That's all of our major stories for today, but I have two bonus stories. Zero, inside a $2 billion nuclear fusion startup. Zero is a podcast from Bloomberg, and they cover policies that can get us to net zero. In this 36-minute episode, they interviewed Bob Mumgard, the CEO of Commonwealth Fusion Systems. And fusion energy is closer with the help from self-driving robot dogs. If you follow robotics, you're probably familiar with Boston Dynamics. They've made several generations of robo dogs with impressive capabilities and lots of viral videos on YouTube. Recently, the RoboDogs were deployed to perform autonomous inspections inside of the Jet Tokamak in the UK. I hope you've enjoyed today's stories, and if you did, hit like and subscribe, and tune in every two weeks for more Fusion news. Once again, I'm Jeff Peachman, and I'll see you next time.